for allowing me to speak to my one of my favourite topics at the minute, which is mental health and transgenerational trauma in Northern Ireland. So my argument today is going to be around the links between mental illness and trauma and how they can prevent healing and empathy. And of course, that can be passed on to the next generation and impacts upon peace building as well. Um, I, I'd be arguing that psychological therapies and counselling therapies as opposed to medication to treat mental illness can help people make meaning from their experiences and that reduces their suffering and allows them to move on. And that works on both a community level and also at an individual level, so personally and in communities. And together these promote peace building and peace building can be impacted if these processes are interfered with in any way. So in 2008, along with Professor Brendan Bunting, I worked on the World Mental Health Surveys in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Study of Health and Stress, and this was a study that was conducted in over 30 countries all around the world. We used the same diagnostic criteria for mental illness, and we asked people in the general population about their exposure to trauma. So this allowed us to establish for the first time, really, the proportions of the Northern Ireland population who had depression, anxiety, and common mental illnesses. And we found um, very unexpectedly that our rates were really, really high compared to the other countries. We were in the top three for any mental disorder, any mental illness, at almost 40%. Our rates of mood disorder were around one in five, and those are the depressions, the, 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 the anxiety disorders, those sorts of problems. And for PTSD, we were number one in the world. Now, the rates were lower at 8.8%, but it must be noted that a lot more people had many of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which would have impacted on their lives. And having PTSD, it's a very serious mental illness and it doesn't just go away without treatment. It can be very chronic and enduring. We also asked people about the things that they had seen and done and we found that 39% of our population had witnessed or been exposed to any traumatic event relating to the Northern Ireland conflict. And that did not include sudden death of a loved one, so that was actually a conservative estimate. But it did include numerous very, very severe and serious traumatic events such as shooting and bombings and explosions and riots and things like that. 18% um, of our population at that time had seen someone killed or seriously injured. Again, these rates were much, much much higher than we expected. So let me talk for a minute about trauma. So if you think about those uh, 30, 39% that had witnessed uh, severe traumatic events relating to the troubles um, and the 8.8% that went on to develop PTSD. Trauma impacts on the body in many different ways. Um, an immediate exposure to a traumatic event can increase your fight or flight response and lead to an acute traumatic stress reaction, which is completely normal. But over time, post-traumatic stress disorder can develop. And this is where the memories of the event become obtrusive. They appear to the person in the form of flashbacks and nightmares, and it's as if they're reliving that traumatic event again. And this becomes very intrusive, and people modify their lives in order to avoid the, um, the triggers of that traumatic event. And that's where the phrase triggering comes from. It's about PTSD. So those intrusive memories impact the person's life to the extent that they adopt a range of behaviors, such as avoidance behaviors and emotional numbing and flattening of emotions. Um, it changes how one sees the world and beliefs, their beliefs about the world being a safe place or a good place to raise children. And it also changes their emotional responses. So people can become very hypervigilant and hyper anxious. And this can lead to angry outbursts, which is of course associated with social violence and externalizing mental illnesses. And also of course, suicidal behavior such as self-harm. Now, in terms of transgenerational trauma, the, the main impact or the main modality of transmission is through parenting behaviours. Um, as we know, in the first three years of life, the, the child's brain is calibrated to the environment and the parent or caregiver uh, engages with the child and helps the child make sense of their emotional responses and, in effect, programmes that child's stress response, which is, of course, the basis of resilience and the, the way that the child will adapt adapt under pressure later in life. So all of that's programmed in the first three years by sensitive and attentive and good parenting behaviours and that promotes attachment and those good attachments are shown to predict uh, mental health across the lifespan and even educational attainment and things like that. Unfortunately where one parent has been exposed to a trauma and exhibits any of those symptoms of PTSD it can, it doesn't always, but it can impact on those parenting behaviours which puts that child 
then may be at a bit higher risk of developing mental illnesses later in life. So this is the transgenerational cycle of trauma that I developed with some colleagues for the CVSNI um, back in 2015. And really, it starts there with parental um, limitations associated with trauma. And if the parent has a mental illness or a substance problem, it can compromise that attachment and that relationship between the parent and the child and the ability of the parent to program that child's stress response in a way that is adaptive through their lifespan. This can, and not always, create a child who has some difficulties regulating their emotional response. Um, so we can get children who have anxiety problems at a very, very early age, or who have difficulties in coping under stress and forming those social relationships that are so important to mental health later in life. Unfortunately, um, this is often accompanied by uh, a parental or um, family context where there is um, poor parenting behaviours such as the use of physical punishment or relationship styles that involve coercion or domestic violence and things like that. And that again heightens the risk of mental illness with the child. So there's a lot of talk at the minute about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And unfortunately in Northern Ireland we've found that parents who are traumatised and in families where there's a lot of trauma, the children tend to have a lot more ACEs. And these are things like parental substance abuse and mental illness, um, some level of neglect and even poverty, which is the most common ACE in Northern Ireland. So all of those things together influence that child's stress response early in life and increase their risk of anxiety, depression and other uh, disorders as they move through the, their life trajectory. Once they hit adolescence, there's a, a number of new exposures that can increase the risk of mental illness. There's new relationships, often sexual relationships, and then exposure to substances. And a child with poor self-regulation, whenever all of these problems come, they can't adapt and adjust in the normal way, and sometimes they turn to substances and self-harm as a way of managing stress. This then can lead to maladaptive, maladaptive even life choices, which um, things like dropping out of education early or forming inappropriate relationships. And unfortunately, this can result in that young adult conceiving children earlier um, than might be otherwise indicated or might be appropriate. Now, the one that's got a lot of media attention is this idea of genetic transgenerational transmission. And there is evidence that uh, parental trauma changes the parent's fight or flight response. And this is part of the, the uh, PTSD trajectory, that, that they become more hypervigilant. And of course, that can be passed then on to the next generation by changing the, the methylation, the epigenetic changes. So effectively switching on and off genes that are relating to the, the stress response. And that's passed on. And the, it's an evolutionary thing. And the idea is that the child's being prepared to live in a world where they're going to need to fight or run away lots of different times very, very quickly. But of course, it can create all sorts of problems for that child and increase their risk of mental health problems later in life. Um, unfortunately, in Northern Ireland, there are certain areas where there's all of these things overlap and there's poor family and community support for the, for the families that are most at risk. There's the collective legacy of conflict and paramilitarism, which means the children that are at risk become drawn into paramilitary activities and social violence rather than being directed away from those things because of the community in which they're raised. And also we have the wider economic context of the post-conflict society that we live in, um, which is characterised by poverty, deprivation and high suicide suicide rates in the areas that were most affected by the troubles. So just to conclude, um, I think that th these, these processes are happening in Northern Ireland and they're impacting on peace building. And the current legacy structures also impact on that because we're encouraging people now to tell their stories, to come out and to seek truth and justice and maybe even compensation. And whilst this meaning making can be really helpful for people in terms of moving on and healing at both an individual and community level, it can also stir up old grievances and it can create new meanings from events when we find out who exactly was involved and what happened. And the rumination that that can sometimes prompt can re-trigger old mental illnesses or problems for that parent or that grandparent in these families. If it's done properly, healing can promote uh, positive post-traumatic growth and there's lots of evidence of that across Northern Ireland where people who've been most affected have become community leaders and have turned their lives around and changed the, the lives of many, many others in Northern Ireland. However, if we do not address the needs of survivors and people with mental health problems within that process, then we risk transgenerational trauma in those families and communities. So that is my argument today and thank you for giving me this opportunity.